Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, let me know if you can hear me okay and see my screen. Yeah, we can see right. your screen, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, so hello, everyone. My name is uh, Peter Malkin, as was mentioned, and I'm the product owner for Studio P and also the development manager for the UK development team. Yeah, so today I'd like to talk about Studio P, and I'll be giving a, a general overview as well as sort of highlighting various recent improvements we've made um, in Studio P this year. So some of you may have already uh, been an experienced Studio OP, but for those who aren't, I'll give a, a quick overview. And also, you know, as I mentioned before, talk about key features later in this talk. So Studio OP is a complete design and scheduling package for the short to medium term planning of open pit mines. And it is targeted towards that medium to short term space. And so that complements our other products, say in the long term planning space for open pit uh, mining, such as Studio NPVS and also mine maps. It's primarily targeted towards metals mining, and that sort of complements our offering in data mine of other products such as Mindscape for stratigraphic deposits. And you can do everything you need to do in the medium to short-term planning space. Um, you can design your pits, pushbacks, dumps, and stockpiles. And in that design space, we have a cutting edge auto pit design tool set and also a surface design um, tool as well. And I'll be covering those later in the talk. So it is a studio product, it's based on our studio platform. So that means that you have access to all of the rich 3D visualization editing capability that comes with all studio products. After you've got your design and your design strings, you then can create your mining units that you wanna schedule with, and you can evaluate them against your block model in order to create your reserves. And there's plenty of functionality there to assist you with doing this to assist you with creating scheduling units using say grids or automatic block creation to meet target tonnage. And there's also um, very detailed full control if you wanna do things manually, either create blocks or make edits to what you've done automatically before. So once you have your reserves, you can then schedule them and you can schedule all mining activities, including loading, not just loading, but also drilling, blasting and any other user defined activities that you actually wanna include in, in your schedule. And that um, scheduling can be either done manually where you select a block, you assign equipment and assign destinations to that material and that equipment's including loading and haul trucks and, and what have you. So you can do that manually and you can, but you can also do that automatically using our auto scheduler um, tool. And also importantly, you can go back and forth between the manual and the automatic, um, which, which gives you a lot of control and gives you lots of capability and tools in order to achieve a practical mine schedule. So first I'd like to talk in a bit more detail about our auto pit design tools. So what sets it apart from other approaches is it's a dynamic rule-based approach. So you define rules that you save and, these, and then using those rules, you can interactively um, and incrementally um, create a design um, for a pit. Now this is as opposed to the other way, which is where you have to manually do it uh, bench by bench, which is problematic. Say if you have to change part of your design at the bottom of the pit, then you'll have to re recreate it bench by bench again, which is a very time consuming. And our auto pit design tool has been very successful and very um, well received around the world, especially by most large mining companies. Um, and some of our customers say it certainly you know, reduces time to create a design from say weeks to days. So it's very, very useful in that sense. So the workflow of auto pit design, you start from the planning model as an input and you can use that then to generate contours around pushbacks, say using an attribute of the block model. And then say using those contours as a starting point or digitizing um, additional strings, you can then define your constraints. Now what your constraints is, it's just a, a closed string and that indicates that there must be a void inside that string. And you can, you can design and define as many constraints as, as required in order to really get a lot of detail in the mine plan. You can define different slope regions, either sort of manually detailing them, or you can use different uh, strings to locate, denote different regions that have different um, uh, slope constraints. Or you can also use the block model and attributes in the block model to define your slope regions. You can create your rules for adaptive roads by defining say the start location of the row, the gradient and end elevation and any um, switchbacks as well. So it's also possible to create fixed roads where you define the center line and the road must follow that line as opposed to adaptive roads, which I'm talking about um, here where they sort of follow the wall. 
So here are all your inputs. And once you can have all that defined, you can then design a pit. And it's a very iterative workflow. You can certainly go back and forth between these different steps, make tweaks, and there's plenty of controls there in terms of what you can um, do in order to achieve your design. So I'll just go through, here's a quick video just demonstrating how easy it is to do. And so in this case there, here's these contour strings I've already generated, say from a, one of the pushbacks in my block model. I'm just selecting one of those strings and defining that as a pit constraint. So that means that there, there must be a void within that string and above that string. So here I go, I've just selected that string and then click um, generate and it's already created me uh, sort of that pit shell at that point. Now, obviously this doesn't match with what I want. There's an area to the left there. So now I've gone through and selected another string over here and then regenerated. And you can see how everything is very fluid. It's automatic and it, it's iteratively adjusted. Now, what I'm gonna do now, say there was a part of the mine here, this constraint string I wasn't happy with, so I wanna push out this wall a little bit. All I have to do is I go in there and I can edit this constraint string and then just regenerate. And all of the rules and everything else to find previously is still there and it's very easy. So now I've just pushed back that wall a little bit very easily by generating that constraint string. Now I'm just gonna to continue to refine my design here. Um, there's an error, okay. So in this case, sorry, I'm also combining with topography. I'm labeling strings that are above and below the topography just to make it clear what's going on and then combining the, the pit design um, wireframe with the topo. Sorry, now, now yes, this part is where I'm going to add some more detail into the um, design. Here I'm selecting a string. Now they must be closed strings, so I'm just going to close it off. It doesn't matter if the string goes through the um, a void. It's just specifying that rule that there must be um, no material above that string. So here you see how it's been modified. Um, now there's an area that I don't like here. I want to remove that material in the center here. So all I can do then is I can go in and digitize a new string that'll sort of remove that space again specifying I don't want any material in that space I'm going to add that string as uh, as a constraint string and then recalculate and everything's automatically taken into account so you see every time I make an adjustment I recalculate everything that I've all the rules I've put in um, to the mind design are, are all there and are already taken into consideration again when I recalculate so next I'll go into uh, generating the roads so here I so this is where we started, finished in the last video. So now I'll go into creating roads. And again, it's very easy. I'm selecting an adaptive road here. I'm creating a new road. I am selecting a width, a gradient, and then I click on the screen to select a start point. So you can see that was very easy to do. And the road was pushed all the way up the mine. And in order to move the start point, I can select move start and then just right click. I'm snapping to points and then everything's recalculated and readjusted. Again, with all of the rules and all of the parameters and input I've already put in, it's adjusted, use, obeying all of that. Adding switchbacks is easier, easy as well. I just need to specify the given RL where the switchback occurs and I just need to click on the screen. So again, very easy to do. Now, I'm gonna now show what it looks like when I combine it with the topo. So obviously this was just for demonstration purposes. So it, you know, that row doesn't look very good. So now I'm just gonna go back and you can see how easy it is for me to go back, remove switchbacks and then re-add them again um, to get a more, a design which is more accurate or that, that is more desirable. So just gonna add a couple more and then I'm done. I'm just gonna um, pinch off that end elevation so the row doesn't continue up where I don't want it to. And that's done there. The last thing I'm going to do in this video now is I'm going to add a road just to the other area of the mine, just in this little small bit here, just add a very short road. So you can certainly add as many roads as you like and adding switchbacks. And the software you can see is very fast and very quickly we just re regenerate everything. So it's really that iterative, um, very adaptive and incremental way that you can construct a design that really leads to um, very efficient workflow and really reduces the time it takes to construct a mine. Mine plan, a mine design, sorry. So there we go. So that was, what you saw in that previous video was an adaptive road. As I mentioned, you can also define fixed roads where you define the center, center line. Um, and here's an example of a fixed road. Now, one of the improvements we've made um, and that came out in version 2.9 of OP this year 
was to improve the, the creation of these fixed roads and improve transverse gradients. So the gradient from one side of the road to the other. So in some circumstances, when there was a tight bend like this, you could have quite a large um, transverse gradient. So here in this picture, I have labeled the strings with their gradients. So obviously in these cases, this is, this is not practical. So that's one of the improvements we made. So on the left, that's what you may have found that you designed in before version 2.9, but from 2.9 onwards, you'll end up with um, what is on the right-hand side here, where you can see the transverse gradients are uh, pretty much zero, which is um, what we want. In addition to the auto pit design tools, we've, had the, we've applied that to also dump design as well. Um, so using the same underlying tool set and using the same dynamic rules-based approach, um, you can use that to design dumps. So again, you have uh, you define the lifts that you need to do for the dump, define any slope regions if applicable, and your constraint strings, your roads, and then you can generate and design your dumps. And you can design as many dumps as you want. You can create different designs for the same dumps and obviously then choose which one is the most appropriate. So again, looks very similar and very iterative and the same you know, the same kind of general approach as with the um, auto pit design. One of the things uh, that I'm very happy about that we've added it only recently in August in version 2.10 of OP is surface roads. So this is to complement our auto pit design um, functionality in the pit. So I'll just play back the video and, and talk you through it. So here we have the surface road control on the left-hand side. On the top here is a plan view of where we're designing, and that's just the general 3D, 3D window that you'll find in all studio products. And then in the bottom here, we have a side on or an elevation view. So what I want you to take away from this video is just how easy and quick it is to create a road and iteratively modify it later. So in order to create a road, all I need to do is to define my topography, name the road, specify the road width, and then digitize a, a constraint string, sorry, center line, which is what I've done here by just snapping, creating a string and snapping it to the wireframe. And then that's really all you need to do. So now but with those inputs, I can then generate my road. I can um, create my batters and berms, and then I can update my topography and to show what the road is. So you can see how quick and easy it was just to get to my, my first um, pass at that. So notice down the bottom here, I have what I mentioned before, that side on or elevation view which is sort of showing the road along, the length, along its length. So the blue line here is the road center line and the dotted green line is the topo. So you can see where the, where the road is in relationship to the topo. And this, regard, this, this view works regardless of the path the road takes. So it's fine if you have U bends or S bends or, or whatever path it takes, it'll be flattened out and look like this, it's fine. Now what I'm going to do in this video is I'm just going to smooth out this road to make it more practical just using uh, studio editing tools just to smooth the line. And again, you can see every time I click smooth, everything's automatically regenerated, including all the cut and fill volumes and all those surfaces and solids that I need. So, so you notice how quickly in this video it was for me to get to a starting point and how quickly it was for me to generate a road. And so I'll just go in the following slides just into more detail about those individual steps. So here's the overview of all the different settings you can do when you're selecting, when you're, you're designing your surface road. Step number one is to select the topography. Step number two is to define the road name and the road width. And step number three is to digitize uh, the road center line or copy an existing center line. And as you saw in the previous video, it's, it's only those three steps that I need to do and then I can already have a road generated. Then steps four through seven um, enable you to adjust that road and to create the exact road surface and road design that you'd like. Step four is a center line horizontal adjustment tool, which applies in plan view where I can use to use basically any string studio string editing commands and to adjust the center line. Step five is the vertical adjustment tool. So that applies in that elevation view or the side on view where I can see where the road is in relationship to the topography. So here I can adjust the road center line up and down vertically to ensure that it meets any gradient constraints I might have. In step six, 
I can adjust my road profile or road section to adjust, say, the crossfall or add a windrow or anything like that. In step seven, you can adjust the settings for the batters and berms. And so you can see here that it's a nice, oops, sorry, didn't mean, it's a nice iterative workflow. It's very dynamic. You can jump around between any of these steps and then recalculate and you can see the results at any time. So the next few slides, I'll just go through um, steps four through seven in just more detail. So here's the, uh, here are the options available to you when you do the centerline horizontal adjustment. So this is with uh, looking at the 3D view, which is the standard view in um, Studio. And here I can adjust row center lines with, um, it's, and you can do that using the standard Studio string editing tools. All we've done here is just to bring out the most common ones you're most likely to use, but they're still just calling into the standard Studio string editing function. So I'm just gonna show a video of just how easy it is for me to say, insert a curve into existing road and then recalculate. Okay, so very straightforward, very easy. And yeah, as I said, we've made, we put the buttons there to make them more accessible. The next is the uh, elevation view, the road centerline adjustment. So here you can note that here you can specify um, maximum gradient. So in this case, here I have, as I mentioned before, the, the green dotted line is the topo. The other string is the, um, the road center line. So you can see here we have an issue with the gradient. It's highlighted in red because it violates the maximum gradient constraints. So in this instance, I'm just going to use these string editing tools that are available to me just to modify this point. And then I can just regenerate and fix up that gradient. Also note that the, in addition to highlighting areas that violate the maximum gradient, I can also ask it to highlight maximum gradient areas where it violate a maximum changing gradient. Okay, so that's in this, that's red over here because it's violating that maximum changing gradient. So that's why it's red here, but I can go and edit that. And okay, the video stops there, but if I change that, it'll, it'll go to blue. At the moment, it's just send, set to zero to show you where it, the parts of the road that aren't flat. The, the other step was the batters and berm steps. So I can specify and separately both for the cut areas and fill areas, the batter angle, the bench height and berm width. And that can be specified either, those berms can be either parallel to the road center line or horizontal at a fixed RL. Okay, so here's just the road just demonstrating, obviously just different parameter settings and how that might look for a given road design. Uh, the last step is the road profile, the road section. So here's where I can change what my road looks like. I can either decide to use a simple design with say a crossfall and a central windrow, or I can choose a design from a library. So what that means is you, it's a bunch of strings. You'll need to define three strings to define your crown, your right-hand side fill edge and your right-hand side cut edge. So the fill edge will be applied when the road edge is above the topography and the cut edge is applied when the road's edge is below the topography. And for the left-hand side, it's just used a mirror image of the right-hand side. Okay, so uh, you, you have as much control as you need over the road profile, <clears throat> excuse me. So here in this video, I'm just gonna make some edits and sort of change, in this case, change what the crown looks like. Um, again, using studio string editing tools and you see everything is adjusted accordingly. All right, so that's uh, all of the tools available. So in terms of the outputs that are created in surface roads, you have everything that you need. You have your road outlines, road surfaces, you have your cut and fill batter strings and surfaces, you have your cut and fill batter solids. And we also give the updated topography with that surface road. So you can generate these using these three buttons here to generate the road, the batters and update the topo. Notice that you have auto apply options so depending on the complexity and size of your data set, if it's everything's quick um, to regenerate every time you change the center line, you might want to turn on auto apply. I recommend doing that by default. But if, uh, if it does take a while and you have to make a few edits, you might turn off auto apply and then, then generate it manually if that makes sense to do so. At all times, we try to estimate or generate the cut and fill volumes. 
And we do that in a smart way. If you only have a center line and you let yet to generate a road, your batters and your, well, specifically your cut and fill batter solids, then it'll just create an estimate for the cut and fill volumes, just basically using the area between the center line and the topo and say the road width and just doing an estimate in that sense. But after you, but when you're generating your cut and fill batter solids, it'll replace that estimate with the actual volume calculation. And again, what's nice is those volumes will all be repeatedly updated every time you generate your new batter solids. So if you have that auto apply on, you make a change to the center line, then your cut and fill volumes will be recalculated for you automatically. So that's the Surface Roads tool. Um, it's just released uh, last in August. Um, so in version 2.10. So please do try it out. It's, it's really great. And again, it's, I'd like to, um, one of the things, the main takeaway is the same approach that we applied in auto pit design, which is very quick to get to a starting point and then iteratively modify it um, to achieve the road design that you want. Another thing that came out recently in version 2.9 was adding a third surface for cut and fill volumes. So this is um, to make reconciliation easier. So previously in our cut and fill tool, you could specify two surfaces and it will report the volumes in between those two surfaces, whether it's either a cut or a fill volume. But now we've added the option for a third reference surface. And so that can be used um, to compute volumes between the reference surface and the first and second surface. So the typical usage that you would have here is that your reference surface is your previously mined surface, say if you're, say from last month, and then you'd set your first surface to what you'd plan to do at the end of um, the current month. And, and then your second surface would be your actuals, so your current mine surface. And then using that, this tool can then calculate what was um, mined and planned, mined not planned, or um, planned but not mined, okay, and report that in an Excel um, spreadsheet. Also coming, uh, coming out in 2.11, we're in a sort of rejigging the UI of this tool to make it more specific uh, to reconciliation and sort of relabeling things so it's clearer what the first, second, and, third, and reference surface should refer to, and also updating the output so it's more specific to reconciliation. Because this, this cut and fill tool is a general tool, um, so we're just putting a wrapper around it to make it easier to know what to do uh, for reconciliation. So next I'd like to discuss about the um, order scheduler. So that's, uh, for those who don't know, that's really our fully automated um, scheduling tool. It's fully integrated uh, with OP. There's no separate interface that you have to learn. It uses the same interface as manual scheduling in OP. And this is designed using the latest mathematical optimization techniques. Um, we have a very um, good team of mathematical optimization specialists, including myself, and we work on this um, for the auto schedule, including other optimization tools. So what is it doing for you? It's really making all your decisions you need to do in scheduling. It's making your extraction decisions. What am I extracting when, in which period, and how much? Where am I sending it? So it's making destination decisions as well. So there's no, there's no fixed cutoff grade required. You can, it's making decisions around when to schedule blasting and drilling activities if defined, and also haulage decisions, you know, which trucks to, truck fleets to use and which truck, you, you, um, truck route to you send those um, trucks along. It can make those decisions subject to all the constraints that you'd want, your vertical dependencies to stop undermining and any other dependencies you wish to have, your equipment capacity, um, uh, production targets, and any other potential user-defined constraints such as a common one is say material movement constraints. And you can do this by default uh, to maximize total material movement or it can also do it to maximize value or cash flow. So if you have revenues and costs input into the system, it'll use that. And I recommend doing that um, even if uh, you know, maximizing cash flow, maximizing value is not the main driver of your schedule. It's more about achieving um, all the constraints, reading, uh, achieving a practical schedule. It's still best for the optimizer. It guides it to make um, sensible decisions for you to specify an object, a cash flow objective. And so what you get there, it is an optimization tool, so you will get an optimal schedule out at the end. So I'd like to just show a video of the auto schedule in action just to show how easy it is to use. So this is an OP project, this is our tutorial project. So what I've already done 
is I've already set up um, the, the schedule as if I was to do it manually. And then the steps to run the auto schedule is to open this dialog, say create a new scenario. And what that's doing is it's copying all of the settings and then saving it in a scenario. You click the start and button and then the auto schedule is just going to run in the background on your computer. So I mentioned before, it's using all of the settings you define manually. So it's using the periods, the destinations such as plant, stockpile, any dumps. It's um, also using the equipment, all of the equipment um, that you've defined in terms of numbers, capacities, availabilities, the truck fleets, including their performance, wind pool curves, and so on and so forth. And there's additional targets you've defined in that standard, such as material movements and very other target types of constraints as well that I'll talk about later. So I think in this case, it probably only, so this is really, video is running in real time. I think in this case, it was, yeah, 13 periods. And if this block, it should finish very soon in the background. I think it only takes um, 13 seconds. There we go. Okay, so now in order, that's finished. Now in order to use that, I can just click on use and that's gonna load in all the settings that were applied then and load in the schedule. And then I can just use the usual tools in Studio as if I created it all manually, just to animate the schedule. Here, I'm just gonna color by phase just to make it easy to see what's going on and then animate the schedule. So this schedule was fully created um, using the order scheduler. Okay, there was no um, manual intervention required in order to generate that. So now I'm just showing you a graph to show that it met all of the capacity constraints and all the material movement constraints um, that were required. What's another really nice thing about the order scheduler is that you have the ability to use what a pre-schedule. So maybe you have a partially defined schedule. Maybe you've got a schedule, say, for the first few periods, and you just want the order scheduler to fill out the rest of the periods. Or perhaps you have a schedule defined just for an area of the mine, maybe the waste, and you want the order scheduler to fill out um, for another loader in another area of the mine. It can do that. So you can provide a partial schedule and ask it to fill it out. And you can certainly go back and forth between the manual and the automatic in that sense where you can, you can do the automatic, maybe go back and then manually make some adjustments and then ask the auto scheduler again to, to fill out um, any um, decisions that have yet to be made. That's a very um, fluid workflow. They're going to be also be used um, just as an aside to just define scenarios because every time you create a scenario, it keeps a snapshot of all the settings. So you can also use that just to capture your settings as a save point or to um, define and manipulate scenarios. So one of, um, so that's a quick overview of the auto scheduler. Now I'll talk about a few Im improvements we've made recently. It's one of the things that went out in 2.9 was improve the way that you specify targets or your constraints. So we now have a source column and this is really makes it easier to define material movement targets. So there's quite a lot of uh, functionality here in defining a target. You can give it a name, you give it a name, and then you specify, say, the source. So this is filtering on where the material is coming from. Um, you see here, you can specify an area of the mine, a given phase, or if it's come from reclaim, and that area can be on a user-defined um, attribute as well. Or you can also give it an arbitrary filter. You can specify that this constraint applies to um, given destinations or given. Uh, material categories, and then you can specify an expression. So you can pretty much create almost, as far as I'm aware, almost any, every constraint that you would want in your medium to short-term plan. The only consideration that you might um, want to use the advanced instead of the standard targets is say a strip ratio because that requires different categories for the top and the bottom of the, the, the expression. This can be a ratio expression. So blend targets are also fine here as well. Yeah, so we've added this source previously, we had the other columns, but yeah, it's, it's very fully featured right now. Um, other certain very special types of constraints we've added in 2.9 uh, to limit the number of active benches the, um, when mining. So the auto scheduler now, you can tell it, say in pushback or phase one, I only want two benches that are being actively mined in that pushback at any point in time. So he, if I look on the side on, here's my, my pushback, I have three benches. I'm not able to start mining this third bench until I finish mining the top bench. So that's what that means. And obviously you can specify a different number of active benches on a per pushback basis or on a per region basis, you can change um, the attribute used to define the region. 
Another thing we recently added in 2.10 was bench lag. So that's limiting the bench lag between phases. So here I have um, two phases, phase one and phase two. And for example, I want phase one to be mined at least two benches ahead of phase two and at most four benches ahead. So if um, this is my cross section, then these um, benches in phase one that are highlighted in blue are my candidates for mining. So I'm not able to mine this bench because then I'd be less than two benches, then phase two would be less than two benches um, behind phase one. And similarly, I can't mine more than these two benches because then phase one would be more than four benches ahead of phase two. So these are the phase benches I can mine at this point in time. Obviously, after I finish mining the top bench in phase one, I can then start mining the top bench in phase two. So now I'd like to move on to a case study. So Order Schedule is used um, by clients around the world. And in this particular case study, I'd like to highlight just how many different practical considerations we were, late, we were able to take into consideration. In fact, in this, there were 42 user-defined targets, including sort of production targets, reclaim targets, and different controls for the different regions. It also included some sequencing controls, so you can tell the Order Schedule to follow a given sequence for a given loader in an area of the pit. And in this case, the client generated more than 300 different scenarios considering different parameters and that they were able to solve using the auto scheduler. And of course, all of these um, different scenarios were obeying the operational constraints. And all of this was able to be done within um, you know, a, a reasonable time frame that the, our clients were happy with how, how long it took to do it. I think it only took a few days to do that 300 scenarios, even given the complexity of it. Of course, after you do that, you can obviously load in all of those results into your Studio um, OP package and then use all of the reporting capabilities such as vendor period surfaces. You can then update the block model as required um, and create graphs and reporting uh, as normal. So now I'll just go into a bit more detail about those um, region restrictions to give you an idea of what you can do in the auto scheduler. So there was, re there was a restriction, so in this case, all the regions are highlighted. Well, the, sorry, the material that was um, to be scheduled is um, colored here. And then we have the white lines to indicate the different regions that had different constraints. So there was a restriction on this very bottom section that couldn't be mined in the rating season. So there had to be a material movement constraint restricting that. There were some licensing restrictions here as to when that could be mined. Um, this area here couldn't be mined at the same time as these upper benches due to rock fall. All right, so there are, again, that's some other more restrictions there. Here, there was a pumping si system which added further restrictions of access. There was mining sequence constraints here due to ramp access. And similarly, in this red area, there was a limit on the mining rate from the south side and also from this rest side as well. So you had all these different areas and many, many different constraints. And that was all possible um, to solve given those 300 scenarios in the order schedule and our client was we were very happy with the result. There's one thing in particular I'd like to point out that the, is a very differentiator for the order scheduler compared to other um, schedulers, in that, and that is the way it can model loaders in lots of detail. Often loaders are modeled as sort of an aggregate of mining rate, okay? So if I have, say, five loaders, then the total material movement is constrained by the total aggregation of those loaders. But what is not controlled as to where that material is being moved from, it's not... Uh, you want to make sure that the loaders aren't moving all over the moon, that you're not doing helicopter mining. And so there's a loader modeling capability in the oil schedule to do that. It can not only control movement, but it can control sort of when the loaders are active or not. So here was, a, and this was a more longer term mine plan in this case, uh, this was over 43 years. So without any loader modeling turned on, the auto schedule returned a material movement profile that looked like what that is on the left. In some sense, this is practical. You don't want to say purchase 0.2 of a loader for, for, my, for the years 21 to 25 to satisfy that peak. So what you can do is you can specify the schedule and say, look, I want to start with three loaders and then I want you to turn them off when they're no longer required, but I want you to use them at full capacity, uh, full rated capacity when they're there. And so instead of getting a movement, material movement profile on the left, you end up with something on the right. And this didn't change the NPV, it didn't change the cash flow, it was more or less the same. I mean, you can see you end up with a much more practical schedule and it tells you how many loaders you need and, and when you should uh, sort of turn off, purchase more loaders or, or, or turn off loaders. 
So that was just to do with um, loader turning on and on and off. So now I'll go in, talk about how you can use the auto scheduler to control load of movement. So if we run the auto scheduler without a control on load of movement, then you might end up with a schedule like this. So each one of these rows is a different pushback. Sorry, each one of these rows is a, a loader and I've colored it according to what capacity, what percentage of the loader's capacity was used in different pushbacks. So you see for loader one in period one, so times on the x-axis here, most of the time it was mining from pushback one, but also part of the time it was scheduled to be on pushback four. And that was kind of the same for loader two and three as well. Loader four, five, six, similar, they were on pushback two with some of them on pushback one. The, these are these are smaller loaders, so that's why they're um, that's why the the graph is smaller for them. So that's what it looks like before um, you turn on loader modeling. You've got helicopter mining; it's kind of used as a as a mining rate. Okay, when you turn on loader modeling, you end up something that looks like this. So, for example, loader one instead of jumping all over the place between all the different pushbacks, it is now initially assigned to pushback four, and then moves to pushback two and then pushback one when required. Similarly for loader two, it starts on pushback three. There's something here where maybe uh, going back to what I mentioned before, where you might want to go and manually edit this, maybe you can change. There might be a good reason why the auto scheduler decided to send loader two to pushback one for one period, or perhaps it's possible just to manually edit this to get a more practical schedule. But again, you can see how the loaders more or less pick a pushback, stay on there and only move when they have to. I was also able in this example to express other constraints, not just limiting the amount of loader movement. I was able to say that there was a limit to the number of loaders or types of loaders you could put on a pushback. You couldn't, for example, have two of these larger loaders, one, two, three on a pushback at the same time. Or you couldn't have, um, or, you, or you could have say one of these loaders and one of the smaller loaders, for example. So you notice that say in period nine, I have loader one and loader four, but I don't have two big loaders, okay? So lots of um, potential there for really generating practical mine schedules to limit um, helicopter mining where loaders move all over the place. Um, pre without using loader modeling, you have to, as a mining engineer, predefine the sequence that you want, um, which is quite manual and you may be missing an opportunity to generate additional value or you may miss an opportunity to, to find a, a more practical schedule because you're predefining what the loader should do. Okay, that's, and that's um, my talk for today. So thanks for your attention. Um, there was one thing actually I forgot to mention about auto pit design. Um, in terms of what's upcoming, we're obviously continue to um, develop that and improve that. Um, one of the exciting new features that's coming up in our next version of OP 2.11 is scenarios. So that's the ability um, to create different designs for the same pushback and, and compare them as well. Just making that a bit easier to do. You can currently do that in order pit design, but we're just sort of making that a bit more user-friendly. So, yeah, so thank you.